uh, we conducted that operation with aircraft, military aircraft, uh, mostly from Marine Corps, and then shortly thereafter we started involving the U.S. Air Force. Well, we actually began the 3rd or 4th of September, and by the 13th of October, we had a couple of storms that had actually washed out bridges, and uh, the results were so successful until uh, I was called down to Saigon to uh, brief the generals, the Air Force generals, the Army generals down there, and they suggested that I need to go make this report to President Johnson back in Washington, D.C. They were excited about it, but they had no authorization, if you will, to use this as a military weapon system. I was there in very top secret uh, classification as a research project. That's the way we were able to conduct the mission without uh, the international community, if you will, being apprised of what we were doing and how we were doing it. It was kept top secret for a long time. It was first reported that this was going on in 1972. That's the first time the Congress ever heard about it. So, as you can see, it was, uh, it was not something everyone knew about for a long time. A long you must time. feel good, though. You're the father of something. You used weather weapons first. Well, it's okay. and, and for all we know, is that the only time they've been used? Is well, that now? same project, that same project went on to and through 1972 when we got out of Vietnam, but they were Air Force was still doing it. But was it only used in Vietnam? Never anywhere else? No, the only place ever. We've had no requirement for anywhere else that I can think of. But it could be used anywhere you. Did you ever do any testing in the U.S.? Did I? Oh yeah, a lot, yeah. You were the head of what base? You were the head of uh, acting commander of what base? I was the acting commanding officer at the uh, Corona Naval Weapons Research Center. And they worked on a lot more there than just weather weapons, didn't they? Yes, they do, but, but my main contribution uh, at Corona was to write a uh, plan for uh, weather modification control for the whole world uh, at any given time. We could send a number of airplanes with, with the materials and dispensing equipment we had and probably control the weather all the way around the, all the, way around the world. With the weather, and again, I focus on the weather a lot because I feel mathematically, rationally, if all the data is examined, the greatest threat to each and every one of us, short of nuclear cataclysm, which we have happening now as well, is climate engineering because you can't escape it. You can't walk out your door and take a breath without inhaling what the climate engineers are spraying. So yes, we face a lot of threats, but nothing can match that threat that's systematically decimating the entire web of life. How long can you hold your breath? So yes, the climate engineers continue to wreak havoc around the globe. The weather whiplash will continue as the U.S. and around the globe, the climate engineering programs are ramped up to ever larger levels. We're going to see radical temperature swings that will continue these radically warm temperatures to a very short, brief, intense cool off as they chemically ice nucleate material going further into winter. I'll talk about that more later as well. We see the really immense amount of anthropogenic damage to the planet. A lot of people I know don't want to believe that. A lot of people want to believe that it's it's okay to loot, plunder, and pillage the planet forever and nothing will ever go wrong. That's not reality. It's simply not reality. And the greatest form of damage, the greatest single form, the most glaring red flag of human assault against the planet ever launched, mathematically, is climate engineering, if we look at all the angles from of decimations caused by that. And as I've stated over and over in previous shows, federal gag orders previously on all National Weather Service and NOAA employees because our government certainly does not want the population to wake up to the fact that climate engineering, highly toxic, devastating climate engineering is going on above their heads every single day. And when I hear from those people who convince themselves that if this was really going on, these agencies would speak out, how in the world are they going to speak out? What an absurd notion that these people from these agencies are going to be lining up to make their voices heard when they lose their jobs, their retirements, or much, much more, depending on how much they know. Who in their right mind would think such people are going to be lining up with no First Amendment protection, federal gag orders,
Trump issuing even more of these now. Is the direction we're heading not crystal clear? Does it look like we're heading any different direction with this new administration? It doesn't to me. And my experiences with USDA biologists, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry to say, they're unlike this EPA official that I'm communicating with. I know local USDA scientists in Northern California that I'm sorry to say have shown no courage, no honor, none. And I worked extensively with some of these experts. And I've been in the field, as I've stated in previous shows, testing soils, getting pH values that were astoundingly higher than the baselines which we had in our possession, pH values that can only be attributed to the massive amounts of heavy metals in our rain, which alters rain pH, which begins to load the soils, which it's doing. And none of them had the courage to say anything officially. In fact, as I've stated in previous shows, I had one look at me in the field while we were testing and say, what do you want us to do about it? How about standing up, being a man, being a father, being a citizen of the planet, and telling the truth, no matter what the consequences, because to tell the truth.